Welcome back once again to episode five of Miller's Movers, where each week I take a look at the action that's happened the weekend just gone, and also take a look at the revised handicap marks which come out every Tuesday. And this week we've also got a special guest in Carl Hinchy, owner of Fugitive, a live player in my mind for the Ryanair Chase. We'll start with the weekend that's been action from around the country at Ascot, Haydock and Wincanton. But it's Ascot, I think, that uh, was the most interesting and certainly where I want to look. Much discussion around L'Ompresse getting beaten at Ascot, but I'm sure I can't be alone in not being all that surprised given his tendency to jump out to the left, which he showed again. Much was made of Harry Cobden, who was inspired and gave uh, the winner, Pictoria, a very, very good ride pinching a uh, lead from the gate and many felt that that Charlie Deutsch and Derek Fox should have been closer. I agree that the race was won at the beginning but I do think if you watch Long Presse jump off Charlie Deutsch was moving his hands and sat quite low in the saddle as down to the first fence and from pretty much the outset his hands were moving on the horse's neck. I think Long Presse was in virtual top gear for the majority of that race he jumps out to his left, as we know. That's forfeiting ground. It did compromise his jumping. He didn't seem very balanced on takeoff. And I think Charlie was having to work quite hard to try and find strides, whereas normally Lon Presse and Charlie Deutsch just look in such perfect harmony and are making uh, lengths at their fences. As to his Gold Cup credentials, I thought that there was an overreaction by the bookmakers in pushing him out to his current price. And uh, certainly as far as I'm concerned, I don't see anything in that Ascot performance that diminishes his chance. For all that I do think, Gallup and Deschamps and Shishkin do hold stronger claims. The Reynolds Town was the other high quality race on the card and Kilbeg King and Henry's friend fought that out. It was a good finish, but I would be very surprised if either of those two horses moving forward into the spring were able to contest graded races at the spring festivals. The disappointment of the race was perhaps Brave Kingdom, but if you thought Lon Presse looked uncomfortable going right-handed, Brave Kingdom was absolutely hating every minute of that uh, test round Ascot on perhaps livelier ground than he's used to, and certainly uh, going right-handed didn't suit him. If you watch the race back, he was on his left lead at every possible opportunity and travelled a long way through the right-handed bends on his incorrect lead. That doesn't help a horse at all and certainly showed me that he was very unhappy about going left-handed. I will try and do a video later. I'm very aware that some people perhaps don't understand what we mean by left lead and right lead. I'll put a video up later on my social media trying to explain exactly what that is and show you how you can spot whether a horse is on left lead or right lead. Moving on now to the handicap movers and shakers and we'll start with horses going up in the handicap. And the first I want to talk about is the John Joe O'Neill trained soldier of the storm who went up six pounds to a mark of 111 for a very impressive win last week. He is entered on Friday at Sedgefield where he would carry a seven pound penalty to essentially run off 112. Uh, he finished very powerfully last time to win that race over two miles and three and a half furlongs. Going up in trip is going to be no issue whatsoever. He's been a bit slow to come to hand but his bump perform was very good. At Ascot, he was third, beaten just three lengths and two lengths behind the Firefly, who's 127 rated, and way out, who's 128 rated. And then he went to Hereford, where he split the Doyen Chief, now 123 rated over hurdles, and Lump Sum, who's 130 rated. So for all that he's not shown that much over hurdles yet, I think there's plenty to suggest that this is a horse that's got plenty more to give yet. Etalon was perhaps the star of the show throughout the week's racing last week. When you take the weekend out of it, he looked very impressive around Sandown, was clearly very well suited by the test of soft ground, the jumping test that Sandown presents. This horse is a very, very classy jumper, and he won in emphatic style. He's gone up £11 now to a mark of 142, and I suspect that he will look to move into graded conditions come maybe the entry festival. I try and take each race as it comes and, and view them on their merit. But my suspicion at the moment is that given that all of his wins have come on soft ground, he's perhaps a horse that I would look to go against on good soft spring ground. Um, but like I said, I will review that near the time. But my suspicion is I'll leave him alone now for this season and perhaps look to, to join back up with him again next year when he gets proper winter ground. The next horse I want to talk about is Nab Wood. Now, it's always a good thing for me when Nicky Richards has a good horse. I really like Nicky Richards and the way he goes about his training. And in Nabwood, he's certainly got a good horse 
He won an emphatic style at Kelso for the second time uh, last week and proved that his win uh, back at that track a month before was no fluke. On that occasion, he had tanked through the race. He was far too exuberant for at least a mile and a half and still found plenty over a trip of two miles and six furlongs. On that occasion, he beat the 119 rated Chooser Copper by 12 lengths. I don't think there was any fluke in that. He's now up £8 to a mark of 122, but I think on the balance of form and the way he's now starting to relax a little bit better for all that he does go quite freely, I think Nav Wood is a horse you definitely want to keep on side. With perhaps the caveat that Kelso seems to suit him well and he will have to do it away from there at some point. And then finally, the horse I want to talk about going up in the handicap is Titan Discovery, who we mentioned a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he did duly win off his uh, raised mark at Sandown. It was really impressive. Travelled into the race very strongly. For a novice, he jumps immaculately. He's now up £6 for that to a mark of 121. On the bare face of it, he only beat Classic Lord by three and a half lengths and he would be £5 worse off next time. So you could make an argument that Classic Lord would reverse that form. But I wouldn't fancy that at all. I think that Titan Discovery would confirm that uh, winning margin again off unfavourable terms. I think he's a horse going places. He will step up in trip, I'm sure, as the ground starts to dry. Soft ground and, and that trip suited him well at Sandown. But Titan Discovery, he's a horse I will carry on following until I'm convinced the handicapper has got him in his grip. Horses going down now, and one of the disappointments of my weekend, or the start of last week, was Lowry's Bar, who was beaten at Exeter uh, by a 200 to 1 shot. Uh, on the face of it, a disappointing effort, but the vet did report that he not only lost a shoe, but he also bled from the nose. The handicapper has dropped in £2, down to a mark of 131. Now, I thought Lowry's Bar was well handicapped of 133, and I certainly am prepared to forgive that poor run, given excuses were uh, prevalent for it, and Lowry's Bar remains on my radar. Possibly the biggest standout for me of the weekend came in the two and a half mile handicap hurdle at Ascot, which was uh, a really uh, competitive heat. Looking further back down the field was Lemilos, formerly a, a Hennessy Gold Cup winner, running over hurdles. He was running over a distance far short of his best, two and a half miles here. This is the horse that stays three miles and further very, very strongly. Didn't look to me to be given a hard time by Charlie Todd, yet despite that, travelled very powerfully into the home straight, was certainly still on the bridle, and as quick a horse is quickened away from him, he just couldn't go with him, but he stayed on at the same pace. He's been dropped what I consider to be a fairly generous £4 down to a mark of 142. He is qualified for the per temps final, courtesy of a third place in just a five-runner field at Market Raisin, which came, he was beaten 16 lengths, but it came after a 200-plus day layoff. Dan Scout has got an unenviable record at the Cheltenham Festival in handicap hurdles, and Le Milos is certainly on my radar for the per temps final. The weekend was fairly successful from the punting point of view from the SVK betting podcast. I was disappointed with Torn and Freyd, who was my selection in the three-mile handicap chase at Ascot. He has normally ridden prominently and, and Sam Twiston Davis dropped him out, perhaps mindful of the fact that uh, he was stepping up in trip to three miles, but he could never really get into it. Ascot this weekend, it paid to be ridden prominently. Torn and Freyd made some nice late progress, never really could get there, wasn't given a hard time by Sam Twiston Davis. He's down now to a mark of 130, that's a drop of £2. And wherever he goes next, over two and a half miles or three, because I'm not convinced this showed he didn't stay, uh, providing he gets nice ground. Torn and Freyd is a horse I want to be with. One non-mover this week, and that is Giovinco. He won just a two-runner affair at Newcastle this week, but it was nice to see him back. He put in a decent round of jumping. I think you can put a line through his King George run. It came quite quickly off the back of a very good run behind Stay Away Faye at Sandown, and I think that perhaps came too soon. And I also wonder whether his young jockey got a little bit taken out of his comfort zone in the King George the front two, uh, Elete Front and Hermes Allen, went a very strong pace. And I just wonder whether Stephen McQueen was caught in two minds as to whether to follow them or sit off them and ended up doing a sort of a bit of both and not really giving Giovinco the most efficient ride. Stays on a mark of 146. He'd be really interesting to me in an entry handicap come the entry festival in the spring, although connections do like to aim quite high. So don't be surprised to see him in a grade one contest at entry. And then one new entry for Gary Moore is all authorised. who enters on a mark of 110. He was a very close up fourth at Sandown last week. 
where he might have been closer, but for being forced to jump out to his right at the final hurdle. That certainly compromised him, cost him some ground. Probably not the length and the quarter. He was beaten, but he rallied really well up the hill. Typical Gary Moore horse, very well suited by sand down and soft ground. Victoria Milano, the winner, is rated 119. Now, he was giving her a pound. He was beaten just a length and a quarter. He's been disappointing so far over hurdles, but he did win a juvenile bumper on his debut at Fontwell. He's clearly a talented horse. Gary Moore does very well with Sons of Authorised. And I think a mark of 110 as an opening mark might, might well prove lenient, certainly if Gary Moore gets him back to sand down on soft ground in a handicap hurdle. So each week, we're going to have a special guest leading into the Cheltenham Festival. This week, I'm really delighted to be joined by Carl Hinchy, owner of Fugitive, who's heading towards the Ryanair, and of course, a very narrow second in the plate last year. So following on from last week, where we started with a couple of special guests, I'm really pleased to be joined by Carl Hinchy, owner of Plate Runner-Up last year, Fugitive, and I am really pleased he's agreed to join me because he joined me last year and I was a bit worried that he might have thought I was the jinx that saw Fuji get beaten but he's he's very kindly come back on. Carl first of all let's start with Fugitive how you think his season's gone um, what you've sort of navigated this year to get to where you get to and have you got a strong inclination as to whether you're going to go to the Ryanair or go to the plate offer but obviously an inflated handicap mark. Absolutely Ross yeah um a few questions there. So, how has this season gone? Well, we started the season with the focus being on we're gonna we're gonna win one of those big handicaps. Thankfully, and, and if any horse deserved to win one, he did. It was a brilliant day in December when he when he managed to win that big race and in the most dramatic fashion. So, you know, genuinely that that was the the real target. The one thing we felt he deserved from last year that you jinxed us on, of course, uh, and then. Look, from, the, from that point on, it's a question of, well, we've done it. We're going to get hit by the handicapper again. It's going to be much, much harder in the future. What should we do? Let's, let's focus on where we want to be in the spring. And I think that's, that's a luxury that we, we earned through winning the big race in December. So his, his run in January was, was about the spring. We, we felt that we could have gone back to the handicap as we did last year and run a big race. We, we weren't so sure what benefit that would have given him because... He's run over that course of distance now probably four times on the run. And is he learning a great deal? Is he get, As he's getting older, is he getting lazy? In, I mean, obviously, when he won in December, he was a long way back. And he travelled up a lot better than that in the past. So we felt running him over two miles in a graded race would sharpen him up. We, we, we left him a little bit short in his work. He wasn't prepared for the day. He was prepared with, with March in mind, but we felt... A bit like we did when he was younger horse. We ran him over two miles waiting to step him up. And we thought, well, look, let's get him back over two miles. Let's get him out of his comfort zone. Let's get him traveling quicker. And that would be the best way to prepare him for, for the race in March, which he, which is, which will be back on his favorite track over two miles, four and a half. Um, and get him thinking and get him, get him out of his comfort zone, get him ready, get him sharp for, for where we want him to be on the 14th of March. So, yeah, that's that's... A way of answering, I suppose, but we're so pleased with him, so proud to have him, and his trainer has done such a great job with him that, you know, now it's now it's time for a crack at a bigger race, and and he, he will only be going the right air. He won't have an entry in the plate, which I think is today, isn't it? Entries today, so we, our focus is on that. We feel he's he's plenty good enough. Um, his second lap last year in the plate was quicker than the front three in the Ryanair on the day, or his final lap, I should say. If he gets some real good soft ground with his affinity for the track, we, we feel he'll run a big race. So there's no point distracting us by looking at trying to win a handicap where off 156, 157, you know, look, a handicap is a handicap. There are horses who would probably be much better in, and it's a hard task. Very few have won, have won that, that race off that weight. But we feel he, he, he will be competitive at grade one level, and he was in, in at the end of January there. He was beaten six lengths by two mile horses, and, you know, that really isn't his trip. He, he's more, we'll be looking, I'd be surprised if he isn't running over three miles next season. So um, there you go. That's, that's, where, that's where he'll be going. And we've, we've been, we're just so proud and, and happy to own him and so pleased that he's competing at the level he is, which is great. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's great that you are adventurous enough to, to, to go for the grade one. I thought it was 
an interesting decision to go for the Clarence House. And, you know, anyone that watched it, and it was a shame, actually, if you weren't there live, the, the, the camera angles didn't do him justice. His his finishing from that, from down the hill and, and particularly up the hill was was really impressive. Um, you put cheek pieces on him for his, for his first run in November, um, and they arguably worked but worked too well and obviously first time out you know he, he probably ran with the choke out for a bit and that that compromised him won the december gold cup without the cheek pieces um as you said you know he he is starting to relax and, and arguably race a little bit lazy in the early stages have you had a conversation with with richard yet as to whether the cheek pieces might go back on or do you think they'll they'll stay off for the right yeah i i, I have spoken to richard we we, we discussed these things, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, his his fellow owner, um, Doctor Sain, he he's he is a firmly of the view that the horse has won five races without cheap pieces. Why why do we, we need to put them on? Um, Richard and I sort of of a contrary view. I mean, when he ran in in November, he'd been off the track for seven months, so he was fresh as fresh could be anyway. And lighting him up even more. I, th we, I think we felt we were so keen to win one of those races and we had it in him. So we thought, let's put them on because first time up, and, and in hindsight, probably a mistake. Um, but, you know, look, we, we took them off next time. It, it, they will go back on. We're fairly certain of that. We, we'd be fairly sure that they'll go back on. I think that we wouldn't want a, a situation where he was a long way behind in grade one race, in grade one pace. So I feel that by, by putting them on, you know, we just... Even if it just sharps him up in the first mile of the race, um, and that that would be the thinking, yeah, at the moment. Um, I think Gavin, when he came off him, we spoke to him in, in the end of January in the Clarence House, and he was firmly the view to to, to keep them on for for March. So um, any any little help, any uh, also the horse is getting a little bit older. We do feel he needs a, a, a strong needs a strong stayer at that trip. We feel he does want the three miles. I think probably next year. We may look at those those other races. Maybe go to Weatherby. Maybe go to Kempton. See how he goes. Of course, you know, in March. But um, with some soft ground in his favour and with cheap pieces, would they, they? They they the discussion so far has been along the lines of we will we will put them put them on for the race in March. Well, that's that's interesting for anyone that fancies him, as I do, to know. Um, you sort of mentioned in your answer previously, or certainly laid to it that you you dig down quite deeply into the form how the race might pan out you mentioned that he you know his time last year was quicker over the final lap than than the front three how how do you envisage the the Ryanair panning out what would be the the, the perfect scenario for for you and for for Fugitive yeah I mean look I'm sure Harry Cobden's going to get a free three or four length start at the, t at the start of the Ryanair um, <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I'm hoping it won't be a standing start. That's the most important thing because he's had that twice at Cheltenham. So, look, the more runners, the better. It looks as though it's shaped into be a very competitive race. They're certainly conflated there. Field doors go in there. Nichols will have his sort of spot on for the race. You know, obviously, you've got last year's winner who, you know, potentially, obviously, he's a, he's a year older, but he's shown good form. He, he, he will be... You know, there and thereabouts, I'm sure. But for, for me, the more runners, the better, because we're used to the hustle and bustle of the handicap race. And a lot of these great ones now, they're, they're, they're run in very small fields. They're run with horses often getting their own way. Um, you, you could see with the Nichols horse in his last race when he was taken on for the lead, you know, look, he, he may not have been at his best, but he didn't like it as much as getting all his own way out there. So I'd expect a very strong pace, and I... I'd expect, hopefully, I would, uh, all things go into plan if we get a nice rhythm. We come home off that track over those last four fences like we're on rails. We absolutely love going around there. And if we, can, if we can be close enough at the top of the hill, then we've got a great chance to stay on. Who knows? We could run into a place. But we're, we're, we're very competitive and we'd like to think we can get as close as we possibly can to the finish and see if we can win it. Well, I, I, I certainly uh, hope you're spot on because that's... That's how I see it playing out, and and I I do think he's he's underestimated in the market. So slightly parking fugitive and and coming to your racing interests in general at the moment. Obviously, you're you're smaller in numbers now than you, you've perhaps been in the past. Um, what what is it you still love about the sport that is obviously still keeping you attached? And then the flip side of that, what is it that you you dislike 
dare I say, hate most about the way the sport is shaping at the moment that has perhaps meant you've you've stepped away to a degree more than you have previously? Yeah. Um, what, what do I what do I enjoy about it? I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm reaching pensionable age in human terms, and my you know my interest in in racing, as, as we can see, as we've discussed, I, I'm living in Spain now. I'm not at the cold face. I'm not working to the same level as I used to work back home. So, you know, I don't really need an interest to distract me to the, in the same degree as I have done when I've been working over the last sort of 20 years in business. So, so for me, and for lots of people who, who've owned horses for 10, 15, 20 years, you assess what, what have you done? What have you achieved? What are you trying now to achieve? Well, you know, I, I, I've won and, and horses that I've purchased and horses that have connected with me have won every, every level of race, every level of race. Um, you know, grade one races, I think we've won about 15 black type races. And, and also in doing so, you know, in a slightly different way to perhaps that people have done in the past with, we've had, we've had great enlisted winners that have cost 7,000 euros. We've, you know, um, Grade one winners that have cost fifty thousand pound. These types of things. Fugitive was a forty thousand ish euro purchase. So, you know, having done all that and looking at the way the landscape's changed in racing, do I see the potential for that level of comp- competitiveness? That level of, you know, is, is it easy to do that? Is it likely that you're going to be doing that going forward? Well, no, not really. So you sit back and you assess. Well, what have you done? Well, I've done loads. I've I've I've, I've achieved. In racing more than I would ever have expected or hoped to have achieved, and I'm very, very satisfied with all the experiences that I've had. What What do I like now to do? Well, without without doubt, it's it's the it's the chance of competing in the modern landscape of racing. It's changed so much over the last ten years. You know, we're we're running our horse in the top races of the country against horses that cost ten to fifteen times more in money. Um, I'm doing it in a different way. I, I'm, I'm partnering with other people, so we may buy the horse and get people to come in and buy a leg or, I mean, or half a horse or whatever it might be. And the challenge that that it presents now is massive because, you know, the, I mean, back take take go back ten, fifteen years. I might have paid a hundred thousand euros for a horse, and that horse would have been at a really high level. Now you, you pay that for a horse, you, you're not really sure what type of horse you're getting. So it, it becomes very, very, very difficult. For me at the moment, it's about competing, punching above your weight, having the horses and being very selective in trying to do that, um, setting them off on the right path. When you've got very few horses, you can do everything you can to get them the most out of them. And then that lends itself to the next thing, which is working with good people. So working with people that understand what you're trying to achieve, that buy into your philosophy in that respect, that treat the horses well, have a track record of horse, horses being kind to horses, getting them to improve with time, with experience. And Huge Tim is a perfect example of that. He didn't look like he was a grade one horse three years ago. He's now running in grade one races, you know, and, and you can, you can, if, if you haven't been in racing for as long as I have and not learned anything, and I've always had a very inquiring mind to, to, to the detriment with lots of the relationships I've had with, with trainers and people in racing who probably thought I've been far too, in their view, interfering in, in the way I've approached it. But you want to learn and you want to, you want to if you're committing financially to the level of any level in racing, you, you perhaps want to have an opinion and express an opinion and be able to say, and, and you know, if you, if you don't understand things, ask questions, ask, speak to vets, speak to trainers, find out how things work, learn a bit yourself. So if I've only got three or four horses, then I, I, I want to know where they can run, how they can run, what, what tactics, what ground, how to get the best out of all those horses. So they're, they're the things that, you know, what am I doing now? I'm, I'm con- trying to compete in a very changing l- landscape against people who are doing things very differently. I'm enjoying the challenge that that presents and I'm enjoying working with good people. And moving on slightly from that, you know, as I'm getting older, my children, are, a lot of my children are of adult age now. I'm enjoying experiencing what I'm experiencing with them, with a wider group of people, with lots of people who come racing. And we have a sort of mini community when we're doing it. And, you know, I'm, I'm not expecting to, you know, to, to increase in any way the level of, of, of involvement I've got at the moment. 
but I'm enjoying the small involvement I've got now and being competitive in whichever way we can with those horses and getting the best out of them. And, you know, and, and also, as I say, what I've learned, putting that to good use. Because, you know, if I'm able to, to help my trainer, if I'm able to help with, with choices of races, with some, a soundboard, someone to speak to, um, I'm able to pass on my experience to other owners who are just getting into the game, who may not have, have had the opportunity to learn at, 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 their expense, at their own expense and so forth. So all of those things I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying. The flip side, I mean, hate is a strong, strong word, isn't it? Um, I think that racing has changed a lot. You know, what, what would I see as things I don't like about racing anymore? Now, I got into racing because I'm a racing fan. I love, I love the sport. And, you know, I'd have been sat in a bar 30 years ago with, you know, my friends and people I know, and, and they would be saying, I would be saying, one day I want to own horses. And they were saying, well, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, having, having sort of been and started out at that period of so long ago, we went to Cheltenham festivals. And, I mean, going, going, to the, going to the bars after the festivals, talking to the lads in the bars, invariably there would be people that owned legs and bits in horses, particularly from Ireland, the people who come over there who, who had the little syndicates and the, these, these great horses that I've been watching through the day. Well, you're not seeing so much of that anymore. You're not seeing 20 lads or 10 lads who, who have a, a horse with a live chance at a Cheltenham Festival. You're seeing domination by individual stables. And for me, that's probably the thing that I dislike most about racing now, I think. I mean, I've just had two days in Dublin at the racing festival. Great time, fantastic, fabulous event to go to. But again, and, and there's no secret that it's, that it's dominated significantly by incredibly one trainer. Um, there's another trainer in, in Ireland, Gordon Elliott, who, you know, it, his it, his phrase was, "You win at the sales, you win at the races." Well, he isn't winning at the races, is he? Willie Willie Mullins is winning there, and he's buying the best horses, and and you know that domination. I think, for, for example, for me, if I could do something or if I would if I would say, I wouldn't, I mean, the BHA are talking about capping numbers from yards. I'm not sure about that. I, 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 and, and, and I'm talking about the big handicaps. They were talking, I think they were general, genuinely saying uh, or, or directing those thoughts towards the Grand National, I would have thought. But for me, having yards with 300 horses, 400 horses, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense to to allow that to happen. I think it's... It's anti-competitive. Um, people would argue that, that that is what competition is, but I, don't, I just don't think it is. I think that if you have the ability to buy all those horses and then find owners for them, and I, I was interested to hear the Mr. Edwards, the owner of Long, Long Presse, he was expressing his opinion, which is that owners aren't sending their horses to these trainers. The trainers are buying the horses and then finding getting the owners to buy into them and i think that's very different from owners you know sending horses over to trainers i just feel that i, I, I feel that it's an unhealthy position and it's unhealthy for in it whether it be in england or in ireland i think there are some very good trainers in ireland and they're not getting the chance to show how good they are and i feel that if you were if you were to limit the if you were to say i mean you don't have to limit it hugely if you say you can't run more than 150 horses in a season, that would change the landscape significantly because these yards are running three, 400 yards, horses in a season. And there are yards in England doing similarly. And I, I just feel that you would focus more on the horses you've got. You would get the be better out of them. You wouldn't have such a dominance because horses, when you buy horses, if you look at the horses that win, in the, win these races, when they were bought as stores, they weren't the top rated stores. Often the, 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 these great horses have found their way into big yards after winning more smaller races, and they've been snapped up after a point or after a, you know, after a race in France, classically with the Mullins Yard. So look, it's amazing what they're doing there. It's incredible how skillful they are, but for the good of the sport, no, um, I don't. I think it's a turn off from a point of view, from a fan base point of view, and I, I feel that it's unhealthy from a perspective of, of competition i think it should be much much better if we had a situation where we had caps on yards the, the, all the horses were spread into much a much wider group of trainers who were able to you know showcase their skills with a better quality of horse so 
Yeah, look, there, there, are, there are lots of, I mean, there are lots of issues over the program and various other things. As a racing fan, I absolutely love the week-to-week -week focus of, of, of the racing program in the UK. I just love it. I, I think there are great races all the way through. I would love to see a better quality of horse competing in those races and, and, and bigger field numbers, which, of course, impact upon, upon finance, as we all know. But, there's, the, the, you know, there's a lot of talk about changing the program. Um, I don't see anything wrong with the historical approach to racing here. I feel that the, the, it's the balance of the quality of horses that, and where they where they are. And if we could spread that around a little bit more, if we could create something that, that produced a, a a more level playing field, I think that would benefit the sport tremendously. Yeah, I think I think that's very hard to disagree with. The the thing I, I wanted to pick up on, you mentioned your enjoyment coming from sharing the sport and your horses with with good people i was fortunate enough to to spend the day with you for the clarence house chase and actually it was the one thing i commented on when i came back and, and sort of my wife asked how it went i said very much that yes of course you were delighted to see him put in such a big run but i mean dr hussein your, your co co-owner wasn't there but his two boys were as were a couple of your sons and for me it was interesting to watch that after the race you seem to sort of sit back sort of a, a bit like a, a grandfather with grandkids, which obviously you, you are now, as we know. Thank and you. You've got, great enjoy, <laughs> you've got great enjoyment from seeing the excitement they had, not only of being placed in a grade one, but what the future might hold. And straight away, they were into the Ryanair and, you know, how exciting it was. And, and seeing Richard, who is a, a, a small trainer, who who's, gets down and gets dirty and, and is on the yard every day, seeing his sort of um, reward and justification of, of running him in that race and thinking of him as a grade one horse was where I felt you got your enjoyment from. And that's obviously, I guess, led into to Rubicon racing. And I think it wouldn't be right to have you on without asking about Sam Scope, who's clearly been the Rubicon racing sort of star horse. One really impressed me at Doncaster last time. Got a £10 rise, which I, I thought was was heavy enough, given that for all, he was perhaps the best horse in the race. I, I thought he got a very good ride and a very considered ride from from Gavin Sheehan, um, who sat off what looked like a very strong pace, and that might have accentuated his his dominance. What plans do you have for for some scope going forward? Yeah, I mean, our plan at the start of the season with with scope was he started the season off a off a low enough mark, but with chasing in mind, and we were thinking really. Let's qualify him for one of those northern finals, and and that's been what we've what we've sort of talked about and how we approached it. So we gave him a, 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 a run to start of the season when he wouldn't have been fully fit to give him a pleasant experience of jumping fences. He finished fifth, didn't disgrace himself at all, and since then he's won two on the run and he's won them impressively. And, and we've and we've found Richard. You've just mentioned that the, the last call I took was Richard, and he was he was absolutely sat on fugitives back having having work scope earlier today, and he's in great form. So. We're, we're we're at the stage now with a ten pound rise on our back and a, and a mark of one twenty five, having won our last two, that we, we 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 we've we've qualified ourselves for the Red Room Final. We've qualified for the Challenger Series Final, so they're both reasonably valuable three mile chases at the end of the season. Um, we 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 I would like to give him one more run before stepping up in. Um, considerably in class um he'll, he, he will run i think he'll run on the second of march either at newbury there's an autumn 135 novice handicap chase there um which is called the jackie upton trophy always nice to, to win a trophy with a name on it uh, there's also the grimthorpe on the same day so he will get entries for both those races and we'll probably be led by the ground and in the grimthorpe obviously he's one round doncaster um you know, we won't run him from out the handicap. If 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 he's if he's five pounds, six pounds, seven pounds wrong, then we'll go to Newbury for the Nord to one three five. So the Grimthorpe, however, can often be a you know a little bit of a it's a it's a fabulous old race, but it's coming where he does in the diary two weeks before Cheltenham. It can sometimes be an easier race to take part in than stepping him right up in class. I think last year there was eight runners. Um, so you know, look, if there's a twenty pound weight band and the top weight was in the high 140s, we probably consider that because he's one of the track and the ground's good. Failing which, I mean, the Grimthorpe's three and a quarter mile, three miles at Newbury would be probably an ideal 
place for him to run as well. So, and we also run Riders on the Storm at UB that day. Um, so that, that again, it'd be a nice day out for the lads who are going to go. So that's where he'll go next. He's 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 you know he, look he's a very very exciting young horse. One two five. You have to run through those weights. He will be up. You know, in the one thirties, one forties. I'm sure in the fullness of time. What where do we want to go? We want him to get the experience before he has to take on those horses. So one run on the 2nd of March. We've given him an entry in the Kim Muir. Um, the Kim Muir is a 0 one four five. So if he runs in a one, one three five, the obvious step up isn't, isn't to a 0 to one four five. We will see how he goes at March. But let's say, and you have to think ahead in this game as, 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 as much as you possibly can, if we hadn't given him an entry in the Kim Yor, then we'd be saying to ourselves, I wonder why we didn't. Because if he managed to win well, either in Doncaster or at Newbury, he would have a £5 penalty to take into that race. And he'd probably be coming in towards the bottom end of the weights. And, you know, with, with three, run, three wins on the run next to his name, if that was the case, you'd be saying he'd be an interesting choice for a race like that. So, so no, no, no definite plans to run him there at Cheltenham. Um, I'd sort of probably prefer to bring him along and run him in a staying race towards the end of the season after his run at the start of March. But it would be a miss of me not to give him that option. And Richard agrees. The horse is improving physically and, and mentally. So um, our job really is to make sure we don't give him too much to do mentally because he's still only a young horse. Um, and he's got a lot of fun to him in staying chases next year and the year after. So, yeah, we're, we're very pleased with those things down Thanks for that. Um, I'm going to let you go and top up that tan again now in a second. <laughs> but before you go, you gave a selection last year for the festival, uh, which was Fast or Slow, who remarkably, given what he's achieved since, was, was beaten in the Ultima. I, I still scratch my head as to how that happened. Um, have you got one, we're still some way out, but have you got one that's on the Carl Hinchy radar for, for this season at the festival? Um yeah, that, that really ruined my week, that, I'm afraid. <laughs> Being on the nose at about 12 to 1. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I, what, what, what do I like? I mean, I, I, I very very briefly, I would say interest. I, I, I would love John Joe to run Mombeck Genius in the same race. Uh, his his form, beaten two and a quarter lengths by, you know, by fast or slow and by Corrupt Rambler, is, and, and over the course and distance, it, it's, it's leagues apart from anything I would imagine that will end up in the race. Um, John Joe has spoken about going to Kelso, which he did with many clouds. So maybe he'll do that. Um, I, but I'd love to. Entries are today. I haven't had a chance to look at them, so I don't know who's in. Um, you know, I, I, I think about. I'm, I'm not a huge anti-post punter, but I think that at this point, if I was looking at a race, I'd mention to you. I think the Potemps is a really interesting race because the qualification has changed. You pretty much would have a strong idea of the field at this point. Um, I'm afraid it's not going to make anybody rich, but I think if Iker Allen goes there, he'll go off top weight. He was qualified in October. Um, Mullins very rarely sends into that race, and he's JP likes to win it. I think he's around eight nine to one. You know, I've, 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 they've won off top weights have won that race, side of Burley and so forth. It's a weak enough version of the of the race, and I'd be very surprised if he if he goes that he isn't very very close to winning it. Um, and I, I would also be keen on state man for the champion hurdle. I think um, I think it's really interesting the the, the way they've campaigned the favourite in that race. I think Constitution Hill's last two runs have, have produced RPRs of one six three and one six seven. And if you look at his entry run, you look at his Kempton run. You know he he, he isn't running into the one seventies. If you look at Stateman's last two runs, there was two best runs, 168, 170. I think there's a chance the gap has narrowed between them, and I'm not convinced that Constitution Hill will benefit from his from his very, very easy campaign. I think Stateman's a seven-year-old. He's, he, 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 you know, I, 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 I just couldn't be certain that, that there's such a huge gap between those two horses at, at, when we get to March. And if I'm wrong, I'd be delighted because I get to see a fantastic performance by Constitution Hill again. So, uh, yeah, um, they, they would be three I would look at perhaps at this point. But I would have a tiny, a really small anti-post book at the moment. Fugitive, of course, is probably my main anti-post bet. But <laughs> I'm still getting a good price about it. 
Well, let it never be said that you don't have a strong opinion. Carl, I really appreciate your time and best of luck come March. Um, there will be no one shouting louder than me for Fugitive in the Rhine. Yeah, we looked, we'll, we'll thoroughly enjoy it. And thank you again. Keep up the good work. Everyone's enjoying these podcasts and uh, glad to be a part of it. All the best.